All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I am Matt Bach, Assistant Director of Strategic Communications for the Michigan Municipal League. And you have, uh, once again, joined Live with the League, our regular conversation with our uh, Lansing team about pressing issues legislatively and otherwise facing our communities. And we're going to kick things off right away with a guest. We have a very special guest today, uh, Rod Taylor, who is the administrator, uh, is an administrator for the Michigan Department of Treasury, overseeing community engagement and the finance division. So that sounds like a lot of stuff that you have under your belt. <laughs> and one of these things uh, that you'll be talking with us about coming up in an upcoming webinar that you wanted to kind of promote is the American Rescue Plan. So, Rod, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the free webinar you have. I believe it's Thursday of this week. That's correct. So Thursday at two o'clock, we are having another one of our uh, tools and resources webinar. Uh, this is a series that we started during the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that's been a great opportunity for us to provide critical information um, to our constituent communities. We've actually had between this webinar series and other training and education events that we do, we've had over 7,000 people in the last year attend our different uh, uh, webinar programs. So it's a good opportunity. Yeah, that's amazing. And we really appreciate the partnership. You've been partnering with us and the Michigan Association of Counties and the Michigan Townships Association I'm providing these things, particularly early on in the pandemic, we had like well over a thousand people on these calls. So I know the interest and demand was very high. I think we're on our 17th one now, maybe or something like that. We've had quite a few with you. So tell us a little bit about what you hope to cover on this Thursday at, at two o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so in terms of our role in um, community engagement and finance division is we're helping facilitate the rollout of ARPA for our local uh, communities. And so we're helping be That's a project. The rest of the yes, sir. The rest yeah. Of the yeah. And, and our webinar on Thursday is really going to focus on um, answering some of the questions. When you look at the face of the American Rescue Plan Act, it appears that it's pretty easy. There's $4.4 billion going to local units of government, and you can spend those dollars in four broad categories. But with uh, this federal legislation, there's a lot of complexity um, within inside the legislation as well. And so we hope to be able to start answering some of those questions. It's gonna be a long process for our local units of government to uh, become educated, uh, uh, learn the specifics of this grant, uh, but uh, we believe that the webinar on Thursday will be the beginning of that process. While unfortunately we're not going to be able to answer everybody's questions right away, there's still a lot of questions that have to be answered. So for example, our non-entitlement communities can't receive more than 75% of their operating budget. It's not clear exactly what operating budget is. So we'll work together with MML and the federal treasury to help answer some of those questions and continue to be a resource for our local units of government. Right. And one of the things I saw in your session description that jumped out at me is, is the league has been telling our members to kind of take their time on this. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, basically earmarked until the end of 2024. Okay. And I think the dollars don't actually have to be spent until the end of 2026. So to take your time, be deliberate, look at investments that have the most impact across your community. And it looks like just from reading the description that you're, you're kind of along the same kind of messaging. No, absolutely. When you know, when Treasury is in the same boat, that um, right now is not the time to make quick decisions. Um, as you mentioned, you only have to have the funds obligated by 2024. You actually have until 2026 to complete the expenditures on those projects. And what we really want to encourage our local units of government to do at this point is focus on strategic planning. Focus on updating your capital improvements plan, updating your parks and recs plan, and to make sure those critical guide documents are up to date to help navigate the difficult decisions. It's still a little unclear exactly how these dollars are supposed to be spent. And so the stronger planning that you've done and completed, it's going to help guide uh, that decision making. We're also encouraging our local units of government to think about transparency. Um, our stakeholders, whether that be our citizens or businesses or our employees, are all going to be very, very interested in how our local units of government spend those dollars. And so ensuring that you're following those normal transparent processes of talking about it in board meetings, doing surveys, um, and, and engaging with your community through every step of the process, we think is going to be uh, very critical. And as I mentioned earlier, the other item is just continued learning. 
Um, this is something that, again, there's no quick answers for. We have to continue to review the information that's being put out. Uh, even the final rule that Treasury has for this is actually not final. It's the interim final rule, meaning that that document is going to change and adjust. So we have to continue to become educated. And the last item we're encouraging our local units of government is to think about how this can be transformational, how you can partner with your neighboring communities, partner with the county, and potentially even partnering the state. We don't know how the state of Michigan is going to allocate these dollars, but we anticipate some of those ARPA dollars will be uh, reallocated through the state to the locals as well. And so if you make decisions today and commitments today, you may not be able to take advantage of those leveraging opportunities in the future. And the last item I'll leave is I just want to clarify in terms of the dollar amounts for some of our communities, this is significant dollars. And for other our communities, it's a much lower percentage of their general fund budget. And so there is a big difference between what communities will be able to do uh, based upon how much of an impact this will be for, for their general fund going forward and their other funds. Right. And, and I know this is a federal program. Uh, obviously, it came down from the federal government, but you guys are obviously intimately involved in, in it as well. What are some of the key questions you're getting from, uh, are you getting a lot of calls from our members? That, and what are some of the key questions that you're getting? Yeah, you know, people are people are anxious. It's a new program, you know, against $4.4 billion. Um, and with any new program, sometimes it's just difficult to understand what the local uh, commitment or role is at this point. And so the primary three questions that we're getting is the first one is, um, when do I get the money? Uh, the second one is, how do I spend the money? And the third one, oh, this is from the federal government. I'm going to have to do some reporting. What do I have to do for the reporting? Um, and so, um, the, you know, those are some of the questions that we're getting. And again, we hope Thursday we can answer some of those questions uh, going forward and continue to partner with MML and others to distribute that information. Yep, exactly. And that's where we had right on today. It's really kind of a promo, to promote the event. We're not going to dive into the ARP questions at this time. We're going to save uh, Rod so he can uh, do that on Thursday with his team. I did get one question. It's something you did mention that I wanted to ask you before you like, before I let you go. And you mentioned parks, you know, updating your parks and rec plans. And the person says, our, our initial reviews, it doesn't seem to fit that we can spend this on parks and recreation mm -hmm. funding. Do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, great, great question. So, you know, generally speaking, you know, our local units of government can spend these monies in three or four different ways. One is impacts due to COVID. Two is premium payments. Three is infrastructure, which includes water, sewer, and broadband. The fourth one is kind of a catch-all, and that is um, lost revenue. And so as once you establish that you've had lost revenue to, to uh, the pandemic, and for most of our local units of government, and we'll go through this in more detail on Thursday, but for most of our local units of government, the way that the formula will work, they will have some lost revenue. And that means that as long as you have lost revenue, you can spend those funds on government services. And Parks and Recs would fall into that government services category. Because I'm guessing a lot of them maybe had leagues and things, sports leagues and things that had to get canceled or events through the Parks and Recreation Department, they got canceled. So I can see there'd be a lot of potential lost revenue in those areas. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, good. Well, thank you, Rod. I appreciate it. Anything else you wanted to add to uh, what the people can look forward to on Thursday? No, I mean, I just want to re-add that this is fast moving. I want to add that um, while... I know people are going to come into the webinar on Thursday for all the answers. We're just in the beginning stages of this. This is part of that building your knowledge base. And um, we hope to uh, help answer at least some of the critical questions. And then we will continue to hold these webinars going into the future. So make sure that you go to our website. If you go to www.michigan.gov slash CEFD, that's my neighbor department, Community Engagement Finance Division. You can sign up for email alerts to make sure that you're aware of uh, those events. And I'll just add on that. That's great. We'll, that, we'll be sure to put that. We'll be sure to put that link in the chat too. If we Thank can. you. Go ahead, I'll just add on that, Matt. I think you know one of the great things uh, Treasury over the past 15 months has been a really good partner, as you mentioned, with us uh, and the other local government groups in putting these uh, webinars on. Uh, as Rod mentioned, we're in a 151 page interim final rule. So we'll have lots of other changes coming. And as Treasury uh, determines more, uh, you know, more uh, answers from their conversations with US Treasury and with, with organizations like the League, 
uh, you know, I'm sure we will have multiple other opportunities and other webinars that we'll be working on with the department to help members understand uh, ARP spending. But this will definitely be kind of a good kickoff point um, as we move into the summer months and hopefully gear up towards the legislature appropriating those dollars for local governments. I do want to add that because of the details, we are talking about an hour and a half webinar. So most of our webinars have only been an hour, but there's a lot more detail we have to get through here. So be patient. There will be a recording available as well if you cannot attend the meeting. So look out for a recording if you can't attend. And obviously right. the league will make those available as well. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And Rod, I know you mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the questions people ask is how much I'm getting. Now, we have those numbers for the entitlement communities. We haven't really uh, got a really solid list, particularly for villages in Michigan and the non-entitlement communities. Do you think you'll have that by Thursday, or is there a place that someone can look for those if those are coming out? So, yeah, you're correct that right now the metro communities and counties, you can go to the Federal Treasury's website, you can find those exact distributions. For our non-entitlement communities, the only thing that you can currently find is the uh, population numbers. But as Chris mentioned, the legislature is going to have to appropriate these funds until the legislature appropriates funds. We won't have those exact dollars. The other thing that makes this unique is that there is the 75 percent maximum threshold. And so even if we see some numbers, it's not going to take into account if local units of government hit that 75 percent threshold. We are trying to work to see if we can get some number, maybe some estimates by Thursday. But I can't promise you that we'll have them available. OK, well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Rod. I appreciate you joining us. And I hope for those watching today, uh, tune in to the Treasury's webinar on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Uh, we put the link uh, in, in our uh, chat here to that registration page, and it is a free event. So thank you, Rod, for joining us. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. All right. We're now going to turn it over to our Lansing team. We have uh, Chris Hackbarth, uh, John LaMacchia, Harris Honor Richards, and Jennifer Rick Trink. In order on my screen here, from right, right to left. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, a lot going on. Of course, ARP, uh, American Rescue Plan, takes up a lot of our time, and, and we do have a, um, a lot of information and blogs on our Inside 208, updating our members on that. So if you want to subscribe to that, again, it's free. Uh, you'll get regular updates on the American Rescue Plan. Um, but we're here to kind of focus today on a couple, a uh, few issues. Um, one, two of them have to do with preemption of local control. And we'll just get right into that, Jen. Uh, we had a press conference about an hour ago, or two hours ago now, um, on the short-term rental issue and some new legislation that uh, it was proposed. So tell us a little bit about that event and where we're at with the short-term rental issue. Yeah, so we did a, a media event this morning and we had the city of Grand Rapids, the city of Marquette, and the city of Frankenmuth participate as well as a short-term rental property owner, um, Viola's Place in Frankenmuth, uh, participate and talk about um, his experience um, as an owner and um, the process the city went through and um, you know their uh, opposition to um, 4722 and Senate Bill 446. Um, we had some great attendance. I thought there were a lot of great questions asked and really drove home the point that um, those two bills that are introduced in on their respective floors, they've already come out of committee, um, those bills don't work. And we need legislators to either uh, slow down or um, work with us on getting compromises introduced like Representative DeMoose's uh, bill, House Bill 4985, that was introduced just uh, last Thursday. And that bill uh, allows, one, it clarifies you cannot ban or prohibit short-term vacation rentals in residential districts. Two, it allows for every property owner the ability to rent on a short-term uh, basis to visitors, vacationers, um, uh, below a threshold. Above that threshold, it allows for local governments to be able to regulate um, the number of these establishments in their residential neighborhoods if they need to. Uh, it doesn't mandate they do it. It doesn't require all communities to do it. Again, it's about those communities that are facing, facing housing issues, uh, regardless of vacationers, and trying to balance the housing needs of everyone, long-term residents, uh, 
students if they're a uh, university or college town, as well as visitors and vacationers coming to experience their community. And we think it is um, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and we're waiting other proposals that um, we anticipate will be turned in and possibly introduced this week, one over in the Senate um, is, and working on those going forward. Right, and Jed, you said a, a really good point there is that, you know, we're not looking to just, you know, ban short-term rentals. Well, I think our, the opponents to this, on us, to us on this issue is kind of characterizing that we just don't want short-term rentals. And that's not what we're saying at all. In fact, we've had many, multiple times we've said that we embrace the concept of short-term rentals. We recognize the economic value it has to our communities, um, but we just want to have the ability to regulate them just like we would other uses within our community. Yeah, I would encourage our members, if the opportunity presents itself, to sit down with your legislator and your zoning administrator or your planning commissioner um, chair or uh, your planning commission and just help educate on basic zoning principles. I think there is a, a lack of knowledge around how zoning works um, in municipalities, and that's leading to a lot of the confusion in this bill. Um, there's been quite a bit um, in the media saying what the bills do and don't do. Um, and these bills absolutely ban locals from being able to regulate the number of commercial establishments when it comes to short-term vacation rental businesses in your residential neighborhoods. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a certain number and part of your ordinance or regulation saying, you know, we're going to allow them in this area along our shoreline, you know, our commercial districts, this, these bills would, would not only strip all that away, but not allow you to, to try to regulate them. But is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct. So, and we know yeah. in so our that's, destination that's, areas that are already seeing high property values, um, when an investor is coming in, um, they usually have more cash to, you know, outbid someone that's just look purchase their, you know, long-term family home. Um, and so uh, there, again, we're looking for locals to be able to balance housing needs um, when the situation presents itself. And I think a good point, Jen, that I want to bring up is about the fact that sometimes lawmakers supporting the bill will say, well, communities can still regulate them by if there's a noise complaint or if there's trash or something, they still have those laws. But that doesn't really get to the issue, does it? Now, zoning is really supposed to help negate those nuisances. Um, not allow you to issue a ticket after the fact. Um, yes, there's enforcement to it, but the basic principles of zoning is to help cushion, you know, intensity of uses and differentiating land uses between the property owners to protect everyone's property values, to make sure what I'm doing on my property is not negatively impacting my neighbor. Um, that is the basic principle of zoning. And you know, for our members and those that may be on the um, on this live right now, who are uh, zoning nerds um, like myself and like to look at the zoning enabling app, Section 206, which is um, what's being amended in House Bill 4722 and Senate Bill 446, that particular section is the exemption for adult foster care in adult and child uh, group homes. Um, that exemption. While it says those are allowed in residential districts, which we all know those uses, that's where they should be, still allows for special use, still allows for uh, conditional use, still uh, provides for spacing between those um, properties. And we're gonna let short-term vacation rentals supersede an exemption in, in the parameters we put around adult foster and childcare homes in our neighborhood. It, it absolutely makes no sense. Okay. Well, good. Well, there's a lot. Uh, if you're interested in this issue, please visit our, our short-term rental resource page, which is shorttermrental.mml.org. We have a lot of re resources there. We have examples of resolutions that communities have passed asking um, their uh, lawmakers to, to reconsider these bills uh, and maybe look at some alternative solutions that are now out there. We have examples of regulations and ordinances that our communities have. We have some research on there. Um, so we have a lot of information for you that you can uh, learn it there. So thank you, Jen. I know this is a big week. Uh, what's next on this issue this week? Uh, we're expecting the House to take up um, House Bill 4722 this week. 
Um, uh, we, you know, that can change. Things change all the time, depending on uh, timing and priorities of issues. Um, but we do expect that to be discussed um, by both caucuses tomorrow, as well as then we'll see it on the agenda and move through that process. Um, over in the Senate, um, it may be discussed this week, but we're not anticipating a vote until next week. But again, that could all change. Um, and we really need to continue the dialogue with legislators on this issue. Okay. And I will note that, you know, we still need our, like I said, we, we need our uh, residents to call their lawmakers. That's our, that's our preferred uh, thing to send them, send them a call and leave a message if you, if you don't get anybody or ask, at least talk to the staffer. And also we have on our uh, short-term rentals a resource page, an action center, where you can send sample, sample letters to the editor to your local newspaper on this topic. And you can also uh, send letters to your legislators as well. But to the legislators, we yep. you make a call. But if you're shy, you can also send them a letter. <laughs> Many legislators our... have uh, started their coffee hours back up. And so participating in those events and talking about this issue is a great opportunity to um, whether it's virtually or it's in person, but to have some face-to-face -face with your legislator and talk about this issue. Let me add, Matt here, one of the most important things I think that's, that's really helping us in our fight against this legislation is all of our members' engagement on this. We are hearing from legislator after legislator that, that they're getting bombarded with calls from their communities. Keep that up. That is what is helping us in this fight. We absolutely need every one of our members uh, calling, emailing, uh, getting a hold of your legislator, stopping in at those coffee hours, talking to your residents, talking to your other council members about engaging on this. It is so important. We will not win without uh, without engagement, strong engagement from all of our communities and all of our residents on how important it is that this be a unique custom fit for every community that they make their own decisions and not have a one size fits all. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. asking some basic questions that Dan, um, you know, laid out there in the press conference this morning, ask your legislator, if this bill is to pass, how will you be able to protect um, your community, your neighborhoods from becoming commercialized um, mini hotels? I mean, how will locals be able to uh, provide housing for the needs of all of the community? There were some pretty pointed questions that he laid out there this morning um, that I think are every legislator who is supporting or is sponsoring or co-sponsoring this legislation should be asked. Yes, for sure. And I will post those questions right here in the chat. Dan, Dan did an extra job laying those out. Um, so if, if uh, you know, you call them and ask them, like, you know, how, how like what, because one thing it does, it places no cap on short-term rentals. So what is the number that are the legislators are comfortable with where they would like 25 percent of their their homes being available to short-term rentals so they want 50 percent they want 100 percent right now the way these bills are written you could have 100 percent of your homes and your community could be short-term rentals and i think we all agree that's not the direction we want to go but that's the way the laws are written that's why it's so important to ask them to look at compromise legislation because this really was a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't work for really any of our communities so I'll post those questions in the chat that Dan uh, so eloquently put in the press conference. So with that, I think that's good on that topic. Um, Jen, uh, you have another big issue. <laughs> Jen's just, it's been all Jen all the time. Um, I'm going to give you a breather. We'll get back to the gravel mining. I did want to talk with uh, 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 Harrisana, uh, is also filing a, a package of bills on um, police reform. So this is an interesting topic we haven't really gotten a whole lot into before. So give us a little uh, synopsis on where we're at with this topic and what is this package about? Absolutely, Matt. So in the Senate, we have a 12 bill package that was introduced uh, in bipartisan fashion, which is being led by Senator Victory and Senator Chang, uh, the chair and minority vice chair respectively of Senate Judiciary and Public Safety. Uh, and this package was a long time in the making. It was actually introduced on the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And the goal of this is to address police accountability uh, in a broad spectrum of areas, everything from use of force violations, the, in the investigations when an officer harms an individual, um, 
no knock warrants. We talk about collective bargaining. There's a lot in this package. And the goal of this, I think, from both sides of the aisle is to make sure that, you know, we have law enforcement agencies across the state that are already meeting the bar, doing the best practices available. We want to make sure that there's a status and a standard across the state that involves MCOLs um, and then also supports MCOLs in creating a standardized process of enforcement and best practices so that regardless of where you are in the state, there's a certain standard of what we could expect our law enforcement officers to be in. And so we've been hearing testimony for the past three weeks on these bills from the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police, criminal justice advocates, returning citizens, uh, and also very robust feedback from the bill sponsors themselves. And there is lots of work going on in these bills. You know, we've been involved with the drafting process, um, and there's still changes that are forthcoming. Um, but you can tell that there was a lot of effort put forward, especially in how these bills are introduced, uh, members of both sides of the aisle coming together to really make sure we can get some meaningful reforms passed. Um, and, it, and it's a good time for this as well. I think in response from last summer, we saw a lot of our communities and a lot of our constituencies really push for some sort of you know, clear identification of where we are in police accountability. And so these bills start that process. Uh, simultaneously in the House, we also are seeing packages being developed by the Democrats, uh, with Rep. NC leading that initiative. That does much of what these bills do, but they do, um, we're hearing that they're going to go a little bit further, possibly including police, uh, qualified immunity, um, and then also banning the use of volunteer police officers. So as those bills continue to be developed, we'll be involved there too, because we recognize that, you know, as those go a little bit further, they raise some concerns for our communities and how they'd be able to engage with those changes. But yeah, we, we've been really excited to see this conversation come forward because it's a little bit overdue. Um, one item that I wanted to highlight in this package as well um, that's from last year is from Senator Irwin on ongoing and reoccurring training. And this was really popular after last summer. And we recognize that many of our communities do put this in place, but funding uh, has been a huge concern of how to make this uh, an ongoing training requirements. So that bill is back. There's also more conversations about how we can appropriate dollars so that MCOLs can ensure that every agency across the state, their officers have the ability to both train and also they're compensated for the time that they miss in training and that our departments can still run in a robust fashion. All right. Thank you, Harrison. I appreciate that. If you have any questions for Harrison on this, uh, this police uh, package that's out there, or any other questions. Jen, we did get uh, one question for you on the short-term rental, and that is, will the bill allow municipalities to inspect these rental units as we do other rental properties, or might the legislative legislature exempt short-term rentals from rental inspections? And what about registration? Will municipalities be able to require registration so that we know where they are, et cetera? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, there, the substitutes that came out of both committees added some language it was trying to clarify because uh, the bills was introduced said you had to apply regulations on a consistent basis between owner occupied and rental dwellings. And we all know that local gov um, is not inspecting um, private residential homes where the, the it's owner occupied. No one's coming in and checking my um, you know, smoke detectors to make sure they have batteries in them. And I don't think anybody wants to start doing that as well. Um, so some language was added, but it's, it's very messy <laughs> and um, it also contradicts other language in the bill. So it's very questionable is, is that helping or in, in our case, we think it's actually messing, uh, messing it up and it's saying in one area you can't do this and it's saying in another area you can. So which one takes precedent? Um, but I think as long as locals are regulating rentals, um, you don't need to distinguish between the long-term and short-term rental. Um, it's a rental and it needs to be inspected and um, as well as the registry. Um, if, you're, if you're requiring that rentals register or get a license, you're requiring that rentals do it regardless if it's two days or it's 30 days. Um, so that uh, we believe that 4722 in Senate Bill 446 um, does not clearly state if it's allowed or not. And it actually contradicts, like I said, one section to the next. So, you know, we are pushing that regardless, these bills have to allow um, for rental inspection programs, as well as licensing and registry, um, regardless of the number of days, um, because a rental is a rental and you are protecting the health and safety 
of occupants that are coming into a dwelling that is not theirs, that they don't own, and um, and that that needs to be maintained, regardless if it's a long-term residential where somebody actually resides, or it's a short-term uh, vacation rental where someone is visiting. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, so the other issue you've been following closely and we've been talking about a few times now on the show is the uh, gravel mining issue. Uh, there were some bills introduced uh, I think there was some frustration on our part, just like with the short-term rentals, we had, in previous legislatures, we had negotiated compromise legislation on both of these issues, or we're working on it, um, and then now they kind of came in with this boilerplate language. Explain to me what, what is going on with these and what you would like our members to do about it. Yeah, so Senate Bill 429, 430, and 431 um, did get voted out of the, the Senate. Um, two weeks ago. Um, now, it didn't happen last week. It was the end of the, the week before, I believe. Um, and, and those bills are now um, being referred to the House. Um, they're going to House Local Government, um, which is a good committee for uh, talking about zoning. Local zoning should be going to local government um, for discussion. So uh, those bills have been referred to House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee. Um, and we expect uh, there to be hearings um, sometime here in the future. Um, and we believe there will be um, compromises being worked on continuously, as well as a more um, fruitful conversation um, in what works and how it works and kind of those mechanics that are very, very important, the details, um, not just what the wording in the bill might say, um, that is then, you know, a couple pages down, completely struck out by something else that's put in the bill. Um, so I, while it's unfortunate the bill did move out of the, the Senate, I think we're gonna be able to see um, some, some good work done in the House before those bills go to the House floor. And there are also, there is another bill uh, that allows for more local regulation that uh, Representative Julie Alexander introduced. She is a committee member um, of the House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee, um, as well as Representative Gary Howell, who is um, a municipal attorney who has specifically dealt with this issue in court in the past. Um, so I think those two individuals bring a lot of knowledge um, and hands-on um, work on this issue um, that was possibly missing um, in the other committee. Well, and I don't think Jen's taken enough credit. I mean, the the bill came out of the Senate, Jen, with the bare minimum needed to pass, correct? It, it came, well, let's, it came out of committee at like 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and it passed um, the Senate uh, before 11, 11, 30 that same day. Um, so uh, it was on a, a fast track, and, and Chris is correct. Um, it did pass by one vote, and we were also missing. I mean, the Senate's down two seats. And the senators that were in those seats um, previously were solid no's on this issue. Um, so yeah, there was there were some some factors that played into that and in getting it out of the Senate the way it went. Wow, I, I have a lot of adjectives when I think of that, but I'm going to hold them to myself. <laughs> but uh, it does seem uh, it, it frustrating. It's frustrating is a good word to, to you know when we spent so much time on these issues in the past and to see them kind of rush through without any regard for local comment or or getting really input uh, and going through the process. It is frustrating for sure. Um, so thank you, Jen, for that. And uh, Harrison, we did get a question for you on the police reform bills, and the question is. Are local police departments aware of the proposed reform bills? And I guess I, I'd also be curious, do you know if any uh, of the police associations out there have taken any stance on these bills one way or another? Yes, so I will withhold saying positions that I know of because I know there's a lot of drafting going on to address some of those changes. But yes, the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police have been very involved from the ground onset of this. Um, the Police Officers Association of Michigan has also been involved and provided testimony. And also um, throughout the committee hearings, we have had robust testimony from police chiefs from all across the state in communities of different size. So there's a lot of involvement um, from those individual associations along with our own. And then I saw John's question as well related to immunity. And yeah. I just 
clarify. Um, um, I'll go ahead and take, I'll go ahead and take the question. Do any of the police reform bills deal with immunity, the obligation to assert immunity or a municipal wanting to waive immunity? So go ahead. Right. So in the Senate package, um, there's nothing that speaks to immunity directly. The only thing uh, is Senate Bill 477, which would allow a police reunion, uh, a police union could be exempt from representing a member who's facing disciplinary action if the union determines that the grievance has no merit. Uh, so this one is very important for us. So in the circumstance of the union just saying, hey, you know, this is not something we would like to take on, that can completely change uh, the outcome as we currently have experienced those circumstances. So one that definitely helps our municipalities and when there is an instance of a bad actor, making sure that that can be dealt with uh, directly as opposed to going on through different steps and different chains uh, connected in collective bargaining. Uh, but in the House package, we are hearing that qualified immunity is something that they would like to go for and to address. Uh, I have not seen any drafts of that legislation yet, but I do know that it's forthcoming and we're aware of that as well as the Association of Chiefs of Police. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Harisana. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. So shift to uh, Chris and John a little bit. Uh, we did have Rod Taylor talk about the American Rescue Plan. Uh, is there any news or anything we should be sharing with our members on, on the latest of this? It's like uh, Rod explained, it's kind of an evolving thing. One thing I heard him mention is, and I think Chris, you said that the 151 pages were actually the interim guidelines. Is, are there more permanent guidelines coming? Because that's what interim would, would, would seem to uh, suggest. So I see John, John's not jump in, John, if you want to. You know, we we've already seen a couple of, of updates take place. Uh, certainly, I know we posted recently updates to the frequently asked questions that U.S. Treasury posted. So uh, again, shameless plug for Inside 208. If you haven't signed up for our legislative blog, Inside 208, please do so. It'll give you the latest updates as it's happening, uh, as well as access to all sorts of information coming from the various departments. Um, but you know, so we had we had uh, new updates coming from U.S. Treasury, as well as updates to the non-entitlement units and some of the guidance related to our non-entitlement units. Uh, again, it's it's kind of an evolving process still. Uh, we we certainly expect to see more changes coming. Uh, and you know, again, this is something to to keep uh, keep your eye on, stay aware of. Um, but also remember, just as you brought up earlier, we have time. Uh, we don't have to make decisions on what to do with these dollars yet. We don't necessarily know what other dollars are there yet. So we have some time to, to wait and see how, how things shake out with, with implementation and guidance uh, before decisions have to be made. Yeah, Chris, on that point of it being an interim rule, it is exactly that. Uh, they will come out with a finalized rule at some point. Uh, we anticipate uh, that will be sometime in the next for I'll say 45 ish to you know days and, and the reason I say that is because US Treasury is in the middle of a 60 day comment period. So no final rule will be issued until that comment period is over. So as members, if you actually have questions or things that you would like to submit um, to be considered by US Treasury as they're looking to finalize this rule, it's a great avenue and opportunity in which to weigh in directly with them while we have you know, passed along many of your questions, uh, both to them and to NLC as we look to coordinate, you know, this effort in response and, and providing you as many answers as possible. There is a direct way if there's something specific you would like to have U.S. Treasury address or at least put it on the record for public comment, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, and all that information is in the blog that, that Chris referenced. Thanks, John. We do have two questions related to the ARP uh, that I think you guys can answer. One is, uh, Treasury mentioned that the legislature will need to release the funding. Do we have a timeline on when that will be? I, I see lots of smiles. That would help for those just listening. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so obviously, the the state receives six and a half billion. Uh, it comes in two tranches, so they received their first three point two five billion. It's been deposited at the state. Uh, any of the metro cities and counties have an ability to get their dollars directly from the federal government, and there's a portal, and, and that those dollars are available. If, if you're a metropolitan city, uh, you should have already accessed your first tranche of those dollars as well. Uh, and then there's the $644 million available for our non-entitlement units. The state received those dollars, I think it's about two weeks ago now, that those dollars uh, were deposited at the state level. 
And so the state then is responsible for appropriating those out to our non-entitlement units on a per capita basis. There is a timeline in the federal statute that Michigan has to do that within, or the state faces penalties on its own dollars. Uh, it's a 30-day time period, and I believe it's two 45-day extensions they can request, right, John? Yeah, I believe it's a it's a 30-day extension, uh, and then you have an additional um, extension you can uh, apply for beyond that, which I think actually gets extended to 60 days. So right now we're in the th first 30-day window uh, for the state to distribute. Uh, again, our expectation is the state will probably ask for an extension on that. Uh, but we'll find out more at the webinar on Thursday this week. And we are still reliant upon uh, the legislature appropriating those dollars so Treasury can distribute them. That's something that our team is working on with uh, appropriations, uh, the appropriations legislators and the state budget office. Uh, the state's in the middle of finalizing their budget for the upcoming fiscal year. So it's our hope that they will appropriate these dollars along with their other work uh, on the state's budget. And that's something that uh, early indications are from the legislative calendar. They're trying to get that done around the 4th of July. Thank you. Uh, there I am. I'm muted. I'm trying to unmute myself. So thank you guys. So a couple other questions. Uh, one was uh, Mr. Rod Taylor indicated some municipalities won't receive the full per cap amount for ARPA as they exceed the 75% of operating budget. Does this mean the per cap amount will go up for others? So the whole federal pot is allocated. I guess they're asking if someone doesn't, isn't able to spend it or, or not able to get it because they reach that cap, if that means it'll go more to other people. Do you know if it works that way? Yeah, so so this is, uh, this is addressed in the guidance in, in some ways. And, and I think this is part of where the interim final rule may fall a little bit short on some of the clarity and some of the things that we've asked about. So it, it, it's clearly identifiable that 75% of, uh, of your budget is, is the threshold. And in, and in this case, uh, that money then uh, would have to be determined or, or that, that, that budget um, percentage would have to be determined by the local unit, submitted to the state treasury, and then treasury would disperse payments if they run into situations where they exceed that 75% threshold, state treasury does keep that money. And we do believe they have the, the, the ability to re-obligate that uh, in, in that case. I think what the more likely scenario here is in Michigan, and this is simply uh, purely based on the number of local units of government that we have uh, and the distribution of that total pot of money is likely not to find us in scenarios where we're going to exceed that 75% threshold in in many cases, if any cases, uh, based on some of the, the ways in which we've looked at this. So hopefully that's not an issue here for us where we will be giving back money, um, but we're still going to have to rely on some additional clarity uh, in, in the final guidance around that. And, and I'm wondering, John, is that 75%? Is that is that for, because you know, we know this money is spread out over two years. So is that is one of the questions if that 75% accounts to the total or just to account to the amount they got that that year and again the amount they got the following yeah year. so it, it it is the total i know chris and i were talking about this right it is it is the total for your for one budget so one budget cycle your annual budget i, I think one of the things that is um is is interesting in here is for those that um you know, run potentially a municipal electric, right? And how the calculation of that revenue plays into that. And something that, uh, while it's not as prevalent here in this state, is, is very prevalent across the country. And one of the very uh, direct clarifying points that we're working with NLC on to make sure that as we calculate uh, that revenue component, that it's truly inclusive of what our revenue is to ensure that we're encompassing everything. Okay. Uh, one other question uh, is, is there a link or any information about the formula for lost revenue? Is there, is there something that they should be following and calculating that? So two things, one, yes. And so we can provide the specific references um, uh, in uh, from the blog. We've got it in the blog. It's part of actually a significant part of what U.S. Treasury put out there, a number of pages. And I don't know, John, if you've got those pulled up in the 151 pages of guidance. But that is also a specific item that Treasury intends to go over 
on Thursday in the webinar. Um, we talked with Treasury about that, the importance of some of these technical things, helping communities understand how to run through the revenue loss formula. Uh, it is, it is uh, very, the formula that US Treasury put together is very helpful to local governments. It is not a static amount of what did you have in January 1st of 2020 and what do you have now? Uh, US Treasury does allow for a revenue growth trend. And so for you to be able to calculate your loss off of that growth trend, so that uh, should be helpful to many local units, as well as again, looking at those things of, of where did you have losses that maybe aren't directly in your, in your operating budget, but maybe coming from things like your parks department, your parking, uh, you know, other, you, you have an arena, uh, those types of things. Yeah, Chris, and I'll add, I'll add to that. And I just posted the blog in the chat here and, and some of the clarifying points around treasury guidance that came out um, just last week uh, with some additional clarity on, on the revenue calculation. Uh, and, and, we, and we do anticipate some more clarity as I, as I said on this. So I think this is where we sit today. Uh, again, uh, you know, state treasury may give us some additional information that they've been able to gather when they have their uh, webinar with us later this week. Uh, but again, as, as we wrap up the next 30-ish days uh, that are left in the public comment period, we do anticipate one, not only some additional changes, but some additional uh, FAQs that come out from Treasury. And we will continue to provide those and post those uh, uh, for our members to, to review and, and look at. And we will offer any additional comment that we may learn about that along the way. Okay, thank you, John. Another question here is a good one. It's more of a federal level, kind of higher level question, but uh, it said, I saw the bipartisan infrastructure agreement, again, at the federal level, is being called for to be paid for in part by unspent COVID relief funds. Uh, might this affect our ARP appropriations if, if this actually happens? I know the National League of Cities is doing a pretty big campaign. Uh, well, I think they're calling it the callbacks or, or something like that. They don't want that. They don't want that money to be taken away from from this plan to finance that plan. Yeah. So, and Chris, I'll start with this and, and add. I mean, I, I know both you and I have been on multiple calls over the last couple of weeks about this issue specifically, and, and are actively engaging it. And and what I want to be very careful of here is that we. One, don't uh, jump too out, too far out in front, but not minimize uh, what this conversation is really about, because this is a really, really critical conversation that we need to have. And we still need to make sure that as we have communication with our congressional delegation, that we let them know how important it is to maintain these revenue sources. But conversation to date has included about using, has included using some unspent uh, revenue, but it is not from the American Rescue Plan. It is from previous stimulus packages. While there's still some fear that they may uh, want to look at unspent dollars from the American Rescue Plan, currently the Biden administration has been an absolute no on that throughout all of the negotiations. Uh, the bipartisan group of legislators that has been uh, communicating amongst themselves after White House negotiations were suspended um, has talked about it, but they have not come out with any specifics as to where those unspent funds will be used, how much there will be, or the specific um, uh, stimulus in which it would come from. But as I had mentioned, the, the line has been drawn in the sand by the administration to date that it will not be American Rescue Plan dollars. Okay, great, John. Thank you. Um, I just want to see if there's any uh, last questions that we didn't answer. Oh, we're looking at that. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the Treasury webinar, again, is 2 o'clock this Thursday. You can register on our, on our website for that. It is free at mml.org. Uh, we're going to be having an announcement later this week uh, to unveil our four finalists for our Community Excellence Award uh, competition. Um, we're going to be doing that on Facebook Live later this week, so keep an eye out for that. And those four projects will go on to vote uh, for the, the, the statewide Community Excellence Award winner at our convention in September, which you all should know by now is going to be in person in Grand Rapids during Art Prize. So we're very excited about that, getting back and getting to see some people face-to-face uh, -face that we haven't seen in over 18 months in some cases. So that's really exciting. We have a couple other uh, events this summer. Um, the uh, Michigan Municipal Executives, uh, our city manager group, is having their summer workshop for their members uh, July 20th through 23rd. So if you're a manager on here uh, watching, uh, feel free to register for that. 
and our Michigan Association of Mayors is having their summer workshop in Sault Ste. Marie, beautiful city, August 11th through the 13th. So if you're a mayor, uh, you can uh, register for that. And again, our convention is in September, September 22nd through the 24th in Grand Rapids. So any other questions I missed, Jen? Anything, any other points you guys wanna make before we sign up? I just wanna say, I mean, it is a, if you probably can guess, uh, if, if uh, Jen's busy, uh, the rest of us are busy. So <laughs> it has been an active time in the legislature. It is uh, ramping up. Again, as I mentioned, they're looking at trying to finish up the budget. Uh, and that usually means a summer recess. So the end of this month, so the next uh, couple of weeks are, uh, are shaping up to be extremely busy. We've all multiplied, uh, testified multiple times in the last week. And we've got other, other bills coming up this week. Uh, I know we just saw a new bill, uh, another attempt to ban sanctuary cities. Uh, is coming up for hearing uh, first responder uh, uh, workers comp presumption for COVID and and John's been working on um, uh, rail grade separation legislation. So there's a lot to keep us busy and keep your eye on that Inside 208 blog as we put more information out on everything going on, especially these next couple of weeks and as we look at what's happening uh, with potential budget negotiations and a, hopefully a budget deal here before before the end of the month. Yeah, and it's really important. We can't stress it enough, the importance of Inside 208. It's not just an avenue to communicate information to you, but it's really our conduit to you and therefore to your legislators to help us. So a lot of times if there's a bill comes up, like Jen described, the gravel mining happened within a three-hour window. You know, with the best, quickest way we can get to you is through that Inside 208 blog. So it's very important that you subscribe and help us out when we ask. But we try to be very cautious and, and really thoughtful and when we ask our members to do things. So when we do, we really need it. We really need the help. So, so we appreciate all those that do. And I, I will mention that uh, John, I think talked about our board of voice or, or, or Jen talked about our, our letter writing campaign we've had our members do. We've had more than 260 of you members reach out to lawmakers on the short-term rental issue. We appreciate it. That's a record for us and it's fantastic. But we have about 6,000 members so the fact that 240 of them have done it is wonderful, but we could use more. There's a lot more out of you that a lot more of you left that haven't sent those. So if you please could consider that, that would be a great help to us. Jen, did you want to add something? No, I would just echo what you said, Matt. I mean, it's it's one thing when you know we are talking to legislators. It is um, so much more impactful when they're hearing directly from their constituents in the communities in their district. Um, and when you talked about voter voice, I mean, it is a tool to provide information to your legislator. While we um, put some language in there that you can use, um, you can completely erase that and type up what you want to say um, in, in, talk, in speaking with your legislator um, and, and follow up with them. I had a great conversation over the weekend with one of our village presidents because they had received back a comment, um, a response from their senator. And um, this individual was puzzled by the response. And so we talked through it. And um, I am here and happy to speak with any of you on this issue, just as my colleagues are uh, on all the variety of issues we work on. But um, we're only as strong as our members are active. For sure. All right. Well, that should wrap it up. I appreciate everyone listening today. Our next Live with the League is going to be June 28th. Who knows if things continue going at this pace, we may have a special one. We'll, we'll see how that goes and we'll be sure to let you know that. But uh, June 28th, and then we'll probably take a break for the July 4th holiday after that. So thank you everyone for joining us. It's a great show today. Appreciate it very much.